because it's not a game, Kate. This is a scale model of war. Every war ever fought, right there in front of you. Because it's always the same when you fire that first shot. No matter how right you feel, you don't have no idea who's going to die. You don't know whose children are going to burn and scream. How many hearts will be broken? How many lives shattered? How much blood will spill until everybody does what they were always going to do from the very beginning? Sit down and talk! Hello and welcome back to the Doctor Who Marathon. I'm your host, Mickey Dan, and today we're going to be talking about the Series 9 two-parter, The Zygon Invasion and The Zygon Inversion. Written by uh, Peter Harness with a co-written um, credit to Stephen Moffat in The Zygon Inversion, and is directed by Daniel Netherham. Now, you might remember that name if you've gone through my Doctor Who marathon. You might not remember where it's from. That's because Daniel Netherham actually had directed um, one of the Doctor Who spin-offs before. But it's not Sarah Jane. It's not Torchwood. He was actually a director for the Australian spin-off series K9. So he make, makes him one of the only people from that production to come along and work for Doctor Who. That's a really cool and interesting fact right there. Um, this story brings back the Zygon and is a semi-sequel of sorts to the Zygon plot in The Day of the Doctor. For those of you who don't remember, the Zygons um, uh, appeared in the, the first story was in Terror of the Zygons. They had also made a few appearances where they've become a sort of nice good characters, um, sort of a resemblance of those of refugees in stories from Big Finish, specifically ones from the Eighth Doctor, which he tackled like um, Death in Blackpool and the Zygon Who Fell to Earth, um, before they returned back to the TV series in the 50th anniversary, um, The Day of the Doctor, where there's a subplot of them trying to take over Earth using um, paintings, and the re resolution of that story is the two Doctor, the three Doctors, shall I say, um, if you want to include the War Doctor, which I do, um, they basically erased certain people's memories of that event and they turned it so that instead of a massive uh, war between the humans and the Zygons, Zygons and the group at UNIT actually work to coalesce to try and find new homes so that the Zygons can live peacefully with the humans on the planet of Earth. Of course, we never saw the fallout of that, we never saw the implications of that and I guess the idea was is that like Zygons can transform themselves Unit will um, give them the ability to transform into certain people and live their lives out um, disguised as human beings and this story actually follows that up but it actually does something very unique with this story it actually makes it an allegory for people's uh, fear um, with um, ISIS and terrorist organizations with uh, many fear of uh, with many fears uh, paranoia um, and in the sky is the whole anyone can be against you any of your friends and family so um, you know be wary of everyone be paranoid because anybody can can come around with you with initial um, evil thoughts and turn against you and strangely enough this story sees the return of Osgood, uh, played by Ingrid Oliver. She's a character that have appeared in uh, Dave. She made her first debut story in Dave the Doctor, um, only then to return in Death in Heaven. And um, I think she actually threw in the first one, Dark Water, uh, where she was killed by Missy. But here she actually has uh, come back. And it is explained in this story that Unlike, say, the Kate Stewart Zygon and all the other Zygons, um, the human Kate, uh, the human Osgood, sorry, and the Zygon Osgood basically kept their identity secret to everyone else except for themselves and decided to become the basically the soul of this peace treaty between the Zygons and the humans to the point where they are given um, certain sensitive information by the Doctor and Clara um, and their ideologies, their ideas that they are both both Zygon and humans means that they are the perfect recipe to be the basically the ambassadors for both races because they, uh, nobody outside of them two characters who have a clear bond is clear caring for each other to the point where they call each other sisters knows which one is the human and which one is the Zygon so that is a very interesting and a very cool uh, dynamic here but um, um, yeah but this you know that's 
that's the case with the story. It's a much more politically heavy, it's a much more consciously political story, talking um, with terrorists and ISIS and stuff, um, with some really quirky Doctor Who characters to boot to bring into this. When this story first aired, it was massively praised um, when the story came out, especially when it comes to the second episode, the Zygon Inversion, um, with tackling the heavy themes, the heavy aspects, and as well as giving us probably the highlight of the Peter Capaldi's acting career. Though Peter Capaldi here um, is at his most strange, awkward, um, he basically becomes someone's dad, awkward dad in his story who tries to fit in, tries to be cool per se. Um, like the first time we see the Doctor in this story, he's playing a guitar in his TARDIS. Um, I can't remember what he's playing. I think, uh, no, 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 Amazing Grace? I think it was Amazing Grace. I can't remember. Um, as he gets a message from the Osgoods, uh, from one of the Osgoods as... The one that, uh, that survived the events of Dark Water, as basically she um, reveals that the the peace treaty is starting to fail. Zygons are starting to attack and um, hell humans prisoners. And the story mainly revolves around the Doctor working with the military, specifically Kate Stewart and the rest of Unit, to try and uh, undercover this. Um, this small majority of Zygons who wish to uh, become rulers of the earth and to show their true forms. Um, they're known as Truth and Consequences, which is also where they have placed their base. Um, and it's during the story as well, um, a theme of uh, <laughs> Series 9, not really a story arc, but a theme, which I, uh, which I personally prefer than a story arc, is the idea that Clara and Doctor don't get much screen time together. Their plot lines usually diverge uh, quite early on in the story. And especially when you know the twist in the end of the first episode. Um, that is uh, much more um, present in the story. Because uh, we see uh, Clara, the Doctor's trying to get into contact with Clara. Um, now, one thing I personally don't like about this episode, um, which I think... I think most people can agree the humour on this is surprisingly off. Um, Peter Harness previously written um, Kill No More, a story which a lot of people weren't too keen on. Um, and there he kind of did get the characterization of the Doctor, especially in that final scene. But here, with this new persona of the Doctor, the majority of the comedy really doesn't fit. With the Doctor seemingly now... Just instead of coming up with um, trying to defend him, calling himself the Doctor, um, and like being proud of that fact, he kind of tries to avoid the question by giving himself Doctor, um, giving him a quirky names, uh, Doctor Disco, Doctor Frankenstein. Um, I can't remember what other ones. Um, I'm sure he called himself like Frank at one point, um, and he comes up with like all of these quirky, strange uh, bits of dialogue. There's a lot of humour here that really doesn't work, in my opinion. There's a lot of, of jokes, there's a lot of, of humour, especially when it comes around the Doctor, that doesn't really work, doesn't really land here. But when the story lands, when the story is playing it more straight, safe, more serious, playing into that allegory that the story desperately wants to tell, the story is so good. Um, but the thing is, in the first half, you don't really get the feel for it. We basically learn about this treaty, this peace treaty basically breaking down as they capture Osgood. Um, and one of the missions from uh, the military is to capture um, Osgood, um, is to rescue Osgood from the Zygons uh, in case they learn information about a mysterious box, the Osgood box, which was entrusted to um, Osgood by the Doctor, a uh, secret weapon to be used just in case the peace treaty falls apart. Um, Whilst here we get the um, interactions between Doctor and Kate, where the doc, where Kate is becoming a lot more like her father, um, the Brigadier, where the debate between our two characters is mainly um, we should try and strive for peace versus um, that we should um, that we should just 
go in head first, just bomb and shoot and kill as many Zygons as possible because the peace treaty has failed. It is now us against them. And I'm the one who doesn't want to die. So sorry, Zygons. Um, and that relationship kind of starts breaking down and um, and it's a bit scary and odd. Whereas, um, Clara uh, goes to work with a unit character who I can't remember gets named. I believe her name is Jack. Um, she previously appeared at a very small role in the start of the series, Magician's Apprentice. Um, but here she kind of get a, um, um, a small little role where uh, she basically teams up with Clara in a bit to discover that Zygons have been hunting around, have been um, basically planted themselves in certain parts of London, specifically the, um, the flat that Clara lives. Um, they have a secret base underneath the building to which Unit and, and, and all that discover, finding out that there's a few places and locations where uh, these uh, Truth and Consequences terrorist organisation have been capturing people so they can take their forms to blend into uh, human sight without being detected because, yes, Unit to keep track of, of these people and so they need, you know, new disguises. At least that's what I think is the implication. And I think what's the issue with episode one is that we have this great global political threat and what this story really needs is what do the people outside of the main narrative, outside of the military, what does the average everyday person um, or the everyday Zygon who doesn't want to be a part of this war, what do they feel? What do they um, experience? Because going by this story, with the exception of the two girls that we meet right at the very start and the doctor tries to uh, befriend to try and um, calm the, uh, uh, the the rivalry between Unit and and the Zygons, um, and it turns out they're like these this um, like this nursery ground. These children are Zygons that keep other Zygons in check to make sure that they are following the peace treaty. However, it's starting to fail, and they get captured by um, by Z other Zygons. The truth and consequences, where they are shown then on video footage to be. Um, to be revealed as Zygons before quickly being killed, showing that these Zygons will even attack their own. Um, but this pushes the Doctor again into further trying to find Osgood, just in case they find the Osgood box, the box, and can basically win this war um, um, straight off the bat. So they go into this small village, and what I'd like to say is that Daniel Nethret, who comes from a Doctor Who series, which is a lot more cheesy, a lot more child-friendly, a lot more um, campy, shall we say, with K-9, I, you can kind of feel that he was sick and tired of that, because this story has a much more grounded, much more real feel in terms of its directing, a lot more of its, of its personality is more grounded. It feels a lot more like Sherlock than it does Doctor Who. And I feel that really works here, that really does emphasise. One of the few aspects in part one, which do show the elements which I do wanted to see in this time of story, um, even though I don't think it's particularly um, works out well, I don't think the script and the dialogue really pan out well, is when the soldiers, basically they're going up to this church, which they know that um, the Zygons have taken all of, the, all of their prisoners, all of their um, hostages, and the Zygons then transform themselves into family members of the soldiers. Um, and it's like, when you watch it, it's like, how the hell are these soldiers clearly fooled by this? Like, what's the chances of their family members being in here? Okay, they explain, it's like, oh no, they captured us, it's your captain who's really the, the Zygon uh, thing. But it's like, the, the dialogue and the thing, it's so clear that they are the Zygons. Um, so clearly it's a trap and this is like, these are military men. It's really strange for you. The woman that actually um, in accompanies the Doctor in, these, uh, in this scene, I can't remember her name in the story or the actress's name, but she actually is one of Peter Capaldi's co, um, co-workers from The Thick of It and Into the Loop. So that's a really cool, nice, another reference to um, The Thick of It's casting with, um, what's his name, who played uh, Sleb, Sleb? in Dark Waters and Death and Heaven. So really cool just um, adding more thick of it actors into Doctor Who because 
Why not? Why not? Um, and awkwardly, there's a scene, like there's a lot of strange edited moments in part one. There's a bit where the doctor, uh, she leaves the the woman, uh, she stay, he stays in the church, and she's like, you've only got five minutes, uh, you've got ten minutes. The doctor then can somehow hear Osgood calling him. He goes down to the basement, um, then they get surrounded by a Zygon only for the ceiling to collapse and uh, in front on top of them, sorry, killing, or at least not killing, but trapping the, the Zygon there. The next scene that we see them then, it cuts basically straight onto the plane. Um, the plane from um, Dark Water and Death in Heaven makes a return um, where the Doctor is now the president um, of the world. That aspects of the story uh, comes back here. Um, and the story then takes, um, was the doc basically the cliffhanger for part one is that they're on this plane. Um, the doctor questions Osgood about whether she is the human or the Zygon version. And when not getting an answer, the doctor realizes that this has a very tiny resemblance to the concept of a hybrid. And the way the scene plays out, the way the scene is panned, it's clear that this is supposed to be the reference to the story arc. In my opinion, it is absolutely hilarious because, it, like I said, Series 9 is basically the Doctor going around the universe and accusing people of being the hybrid. It's funny. I don't know. I just really I just find it amusing, especially when you consider that, no, this is not the hybrid. As a hybrid would be a human and Zygon genetics, Zygon and human DNA combined to make one individual. This is not that. This is two people, one a Zygon, one a human, um, but not revealing their, uh, their biological identity uh, to uh, the people. This is, this is more to do with their personality, their uh, performativism um, as a person, as they don't identify as human or Zygon, but in fact, they identify as both, if that makes a sense. I do actually really like this concept, um, even though it does constantly lead to scenes where characters are constantly questioning her, are you a human or are you a Zygon? And she just doesn't answer. Um, it was interesting and unique when the first time it has it, but it was kind of felt a bit pandering, um, a bit, not pandering, what's the word I'm looking for? Patronising, when it was constantly happening. Uh, I know she's not a real cat person, but I feel really bad for Osgood with people constantly questioning her identity like that. Um, but it turns out then the, the Zygon, the, the uh, Clara that we've been following throughout the story, is actually a Zygon duplicate that has captured um, the real Clara and uh, at the start of the story and took her into a, a cocoon of sorts. And so uh, this Zygon, uh, which turned out to be the leader of these Zygons named Bonnie, um, uses a rocket launcher to destroy the hair, the plane that the Doctor is on. I really like this cliffhanger. It's a lot more simple. It's not this big dramatic reveal. It's not a turn. It's literally a threat that's been revealed where you have this rocket launcher go into the plane which the Doctor and Osgood find themselves in. And there's a really great cliffhanger. The start of the second episode, which I think is a lot more better in my opinion, um, actually starts off really strange and reminds me a lot, um, like I said, the second episode gets a, um, a co-credit uh, from a writer with Stephen Moffat and I feel like this is the scene where Stephen Moffat wrote because it's very similar to the concept of the girl in her dreamland and seeing reality through a TV in the story um, Silence of the Library and Forest of the Dead where Clara um, seemingly wakes up in a normal in a normal room but something's odd I like the uh, the different odd camera angles um, how she sees the clock on her the digital clock um, backwards and she sees the toothpaste which she says this is a tough this is toothpaste and she puts it on and it's like this black it's almost um, snail slime which is really disgusting and we basically learn that she's in this kind of dream state and she can kind of is semi-conscious of her what she does uh of what her zygon duplicate is doing and so she somehow influences shaking the tv in her dream 
um, the Zygons Clara, uh, Barney's aim, missing the, ta missing the plane, first of all, giving the Doctor and Osgood time to get um, parachute jetpack, uh, jetpacks on my parachute so they can escape um, as the plane starts to crash. Um, as um, Barney gets to shoot another rocket launcher missile and hit in the plane, destroying it. Lead in. Uh, so part two uh, mainly has the Doctor and Osgood um, after that mission is now completed with bringing back Osgood. Um, I just caught a fly. Did you just see that? That was really weird. Anyway, um, I better be caught on camera. Uh, the Doctor and Osgood basically, uh, Osgood becomes basically the companion for the second half as the Doctor and Osgood basically try to survive um, uh, the UK, London, and they're trying to get back to um, the Black Archives as the Zygons basically have learned that the Os the Osgood box, which could destroy all humans or all Zygons, destroy the peace treaty, um, has been found. It's in the Black Archives and the Doctor and Osgood need to go there and they have this kind of little road trip where they also interact with a particular Zygon who... Um, who we later, uh, who we learn um, in this story is one of the civilians, shall we say? He's a Zygon that doesn't take part in this um, in this terrorist um, organization, this small minority of Zygons. Um, he is a Zygon, but he doesn't want to do anything to do with them. He wants to live on humanity. He wants to live um, in the UK in peace. It's how he lives. This is his identity. He doesn't want to leave this um, world. However, because of something that Bonnie has done, he tra uh, it's transformed him back into the Zygon form and he really doesn't want to live like that. And this is easily one of the best things, and this is one of the best things in this story, this allegory uh, gets pushed to the forefront in these scenes where this person is basically forced to become um, this kind of monster. And the Doctor and Osgood are like trying to calm him down. It's like, it's okay, we are for our friends, help us. And he's just like, no, you could be one of them. You could be a part of Truth and Consequences. Um, and he's like, I just wanted to live my own life. I just wanted to be, oh no, I have no, I have no, I am, I have no part in this war. I am not on either side. I just want to live on my own. Is that too much to ask? Which then leads to him killing himself, committing suicide. And that is a really great dramatic scene. And it is something which, um, which really does like emphasize how great um, uh, that that the idea of this story, the political like, messaging of this story, is important. Because let's not forget, this story is an allegory allegory of Islam's uh, not Islam. Sorry, that is really bad on my part. Um, ISIS and Islam Islamophobia, um, where people um, from multiple like Eastern um, locations have been like immigrated or asylum seeking or actually you know legally live here um but people are fear of them they hate them they don't like them just because a because of isis which um look in terms of appearance the same because they they wear the, the things they they have the particular skeleton skin they have the beards um because of the resemblance to them they in, people instantly connect these two kind of ideas together and that's what this story is trying to say per se um and using the zygons essentially as as um as the allegory for islamophobia and isis throughout the story and it's really interesting it's really strange how realistically this um this political messaging is taking itself too ser it's taking itself really seriously and i think this story needed that grounded resemblance in this story i did wish that we got a lot more of the down to earth the everyday individual like what did they think what did they feel but the story does a great job at keeping you interested in this allegory it's by no means subtle especially when you get to the final act uh, where they're all in the black archives um but it's, it's really sensitive to the subject and really is just going full forth into the ideas that this story is trying to tell. This, of course, 
leads into the scene in the Black Archives, where it's revealed that there is not one, but two Osgood boxes. One of them um, has, the, um, has the ability to destroy Zygons, or uh, turning them, um, keeping them alive, and changing them so they all reveal their Zygon um, appearances, um, so there's no way to hide, and the terrorist organisation can use that to rattleize rattleize more individuals into their cause. Whilst the other box uh, will release a missile underneath them, destroying all of London in the vein that um, that the Black Archive is tampered with, or if somebody can use this great and powerful weapon. And Kate Stewart and and Bonnie basically are putting their hands on the button, uh, over the over the button, uh, shaking with every nerve. Tempted, tempted to press one of the buttons to make a decision. It's a 50-50 chance for both of them, but they're willing to take it because they just need to win this war. To which the Doctor kind of turns this into a sort of game show with he has this American accent. Um, I personally hated that aspect of, that, of this story, um, where the Doctor's doing that American accent, and I know a lot of people didn't like that to begin with. Um, but after learning why... Um, essentially, there was an American TV show called Two Truth and Consequences. Um, and you know, there's a truth, and if you lie about that, then you follow the consequences. And it's all like, this, it's part of the political messaging. I don't really understand it myself because I've never seen the show. Um, but the idea is it, it resembles this game show from America. So I guess it's not as bad. But this then pushes the Doctor to make that speech where he basically proclaims to everyone, it's like, you don't know... If you don't know what you're fighting for, you don't know what you're trying to achieve. You just want the cruelty to forgive cruelty. You just want to punish those and not think about the people who are suffer in your wake. Um, as a, as the quote says, you don't know um, who is going to die, whose lives will suffer, um, whose children will be able to scream and burn until everybody does what they were on from the very beginning, sit down and talk. This is one, probably one of the most passionate scenes um, and a great anti-war speech from the Doctor. It is also, as everybody points out, one of the best performances by Peter Capaldi. Um, even though I think in this story, um, this is probably his weakest um, in terms of overall. As the, He's not really given much to do for the majority of the story. He's usually given these jokes, which, I, like I said at the start of the video, doesn't really work, doesn't really land. But it makes all up for it for this one scene. He is so good. So passionate. He is so... I especially like when um, he makes the comparison between this war. It's like this funny little war. Um, this is nothing. I fought in a war that's bigger than this war. I like, and then, uh, When I close my eyes and he compares it to the Time War. And it's just how ridiculous the, the ideas are. Um, and... I also personally really like the twist where it turns out there's nothing in the boxes. There's nothing there. Um, it was basically a ploy by the Doctor to try and get um, these characters to see reason, to see um, that benefiting from each other is better than fighting an all-out war. Um, um, there is a really dull line where the Doctor proclaims that he's erased their memories constantly until he basically got it right. Um... And that bit's pretty dumb. I hope, I, I just presume that's a joke because throughout the story, the Doctor has told some really clear lies. Doc Disto, Dr. Frankenstein, uh, he says his first name. Uh, the story also as well has the scene where the Doctor and Osgood, Osgood looks into the Doctor's history, uh, his internet history, basically kind of canonizing that the 12th Doctor is a porn addict. I didn't need to know that, but it's a fact in Doctor Who now. Um, and so the Zygons are now living back in peace as the treaty has been, um, as the ceasefire has broken out, um, the war is over. Um, the Doctor offers Osgood to come on the TARDIS, but she's like, no, uh, because we need the we need me to keep the treaty and also as well we basically learn that after these events um, Bonnie actually transforms uh, herself 
or himself, I don't know how the gender of Zygons work, into another duplicate of Osgood. So we've now got two Osgoods again. And that is the end of the Zygon invasion and Zygon inversion. Um, before, I, before I begin, uh, continue, um, I did say in my last video, I might talk about the, the webcast story, um, the Zygon isolation. Um, however, after watching, I have watched it, um, but I didn't feel like it deserved to be connected with this story. It felt very much more self-contained and it references the 13th Doctor. So I've decided to put that off from this video. But it's okay if you haven't seen it. Um, so that is the Zygon Invasion, Zygon Inversion. Overall, it is a fantastic story. One of the highlights of the Peter Capaldi era. Peter Capaldi. Peter Capaldi. Uh, I can't say his name. Peter Capaldi's era of the series. It is well directed, well written for the most part, though there are certain scenes, certain dialogues, certain moments, specifically when it comes to the humour of the story, that falls flat in my opinion. But the story has an idea, it has a purpose, and for the purpose it's trying to tell, I think it does a very good job, especially in the second half, in the second episode, um, in dealing with that concept. And that's why this story, in my opinion, is really, really good. So there you go, that's the Zygon Invasion and Zygon Inversion. So join me next time where we have the first ever found footage story in the Doctor Who canon. As the Doctor and Clara tra uh, find themselves on a spaceship where these creatures um, that are created by these machines that presumably stop the need for rest. Um, and a, scient a mad scientist seemingly is on the loose. So join me next time for Sleep No More. And I'll see you next time on Doctor Who Marathon. ta -ra.